Beckett Mariner is Cito Jax's fan club. The Ferengi put a paywall on a bomb, and Livick and Rutherford only like each other when they're twaining. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are doing a review of Star Trek Lower Decks Season 4, Episode 10, Old Friends, New Planets, written by Mae Darman, directed by Bob Suarez. We have an incredible guest, everybody, showrunner of Lower Decks. It is Mike McMahon. How are you, Mike? Hey, happy to be back. Thank you for having me. Oh, glad to have you back, man. Absolutely. Great season, by the way. I got to say that on the record. Start off right away. We've been enjoying this season for very good season, in my opinion, just like from start to finish, giving us a new character uh, with Talyn and and just keeping this overarching story arch. It's just been a real joy to watch this season. Well, mm -hmm. thank you so much. And, you know, it's it's always scary because, like, we we did this season last year. You know, and we're finishing it up right as it's airing. But, you know, we know we love it, but we we're never doing anything specifically because we think the fans are gonna love it. We're doing it because we love it. And so it's sometimes it's a gamble. You know what I mean? And then seeing just, you know, positive response and people loving to Lynn and people loving the storylines we're doing, it's it's awesome, you know, and and now with the finale out, like I can finally, you know, a Thursday can hit where I'm not like super stressed <laughs> anymore. <laughs> hey, uh, Mike, before we get into it, you just dropped a little nugget there that I want to uh, elaborate on or have you elaborate on. You mentioned uh, doing things that you love versus things that the fans may or may not love. Was there something ever in the writer's room, probably multiple times, where you're like, we would love to do X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. but we can't because the fans are, are not going to get it. Um, not really, not really specifically because the fans won't get it. Sometimes we want to do X, Y, Z, but my rules about where in the timeline Lower Decks takes place, you know, like, like I'm fan, I'm a fan of obviously all of Star Trek and there's just some stuff that doesn't make a ton of sense to include. Like I'd love to just, you know, bring in characters from enterprise you know what i mean or or from whatever or from the 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 gamma quadrant or or what have you and it's which we we did we did do once but you know usually it's our own parameters when i mean like you know from a storytelling point of view the i'm really trying to please myself like this is a show all the victories and all the mistakes of this show like the things that you might not like but the things that you love it's all because I feel like I'm getting away with something, getting to make a Star Trek show. And it's it's things that I really wanted to do. And I think, you know, every fan comes to Star Trek with their own, the things that they love the most. You know what I mean? Like I have somebody on uh, somebody on Twitter, you know, constantly being like, come on, McMahon, more Cardassians. And I'm like, look, dude, I like Cardassians <laughs> too, but like not, not enough to like get less of the other stuff we're doing. But, you know, I hope that, Lower Decks is kind of, if you love Lower Decks, it's kind of a proof of like a super fan can kind of make a show for themselves. And it doesn't, you know, the things that could read as fan service to other people, it's sort of, yeah, it's fan service to me. Like I'm a fan. It's this thing I wanted, stories I wanted to tell, ways I wanted to tell it. So, you know, it's a little, it, it's funny because like then the episode airs and it's out in the world. It's not mine anymore. You know, the episodes are only mine while we're in production and then the second it airs it belongs to everybody else you know and it's kind of a it's kind of a messed up way to make tv like i'm supposed to be making all of you happy and i think that like my initial theory was well if i'm happy it means you'll all be happy and mm -hmm. and most of the time that works um sometimes people are like what are you doing McMahon? but like you know so it's uh it's just fun. It, I, I just continue to be really lucky to get to work within Star Trek because it's so beloved. And like, you know, you guys are fans too. Like we're the first people to be like, that's not Star Trek. Get out of here. You know what I mean? Or like we, when you love something like we do, you hold it to the highest sort of scrutiny. Right. And yeah, but, but I don't go into Star Trek looking to scrutinize. I go into Star Trek 
looking to be in Star Trek for a little while. And the only thing that pulls me out of it is when, when I feel like it's not giving me that. And so by making the show just for myself, hopefully, whether you like the episode or not, it feels like you're in Star Trek for half an hour, you know, and that that was like, that's like, I think the one saving grace for me whenever somebody might not agree with what story I want to tell or whatever, like, listen, you just got another 30 minutes of Star Trek, baby. <laughs> Let's go. It's hard to do. That's great. Great um, Star Trek. I, I want to ask you about, you know, some of the showrunner decisions that you make, Mike. Um, this season, we talked to a few people who got their first chance to be directors. They went up from storyboard artists yeah. to now having the chance to direct episodes. And I want to commend you for, for for giving them the opportunity because these are people that really want to do this and are passionate about it. And we saw it in the work, the kind of quality that they delivered. Um, so one, the kind of decisions that go into you know giving those opportunities out when you see them as yeah. a showrunner, and also um, the how much of fan input from watching the response from fans yeah. alters alters the directions or maybe makes adjustments to, to what you insert or don't insert. Yeah, so when it comes to the directors, really, I have to give that up to Barry Kelly, who's our supervising director, the king of the directors. Because like the way we make the episodes are, on an animated show, a director is somebody who draws, right? They're not behind a camera. They are the camera. Mm -hmm. They are the they are the on-screen presence, you know? So each director of each episode has board teams, you know? And then in their board team, they're putting together sequences, then they're polishing it and making sure it looks like their vision of the episode. And then it all goes up to Barry Kelly, the supervising director, who's the the drawing director above all the directors that makes sure that like whether, you know, when you have these different episodic directors, what makes the show feel like the show at the end of the day? You know, ultimately, did they bring themselves into it, but does it also fit into lower decks in a, in a larger scale? And, you know, I would hope that most shows, when you find people that are doing a great job at, at a lower level, you know, they're still drawing, they're still directing sequences. And you just find people that, that you know, either they make you laugh or they make you cry or they make you think. And it's like, oh, you know, what would that person's episode be like, you know, and, and Barry, Barry comes from this world at, at Titmouse Animation where like, you don't, you don't only want to find people who are new and, and, and give them opportunities and train them and, and see what they've got. But you're also like, you're working with them on multiple projects too. Like I'll bounce people from lower decks to solar opposites and back again when the different productions are up, because you just find people that you like to work with. We're all trying to make this thing. We're all trying to go from zero to something. Right. And when you find people that can look at a script and it makes them laugh and then they can draw it and it makes you laugh on the screen, it's the same thing with actors. Like when I found Tawny and Jack and, and Noel and Eugene and everybody, like you find people that fit into this thing you're trying to make from nothing, you know, and then every little piece is another piece of the puzzle. So, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll be watching another show and we're like, Oh, I'm a big fan of that. I got to find out who's making that, see if we can work with them. And a lot of the times, you know, you're finding those really talented people from within and you're, you're wanting to give them more opportunities. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of it is really like our, our line producer does a lot of that. Our line producer really knows our line producer can draw too. She drew, um, <laughs> Megan Trevino. She drew the space whales shirt for us, like a couple of scenes ago, which cool. I love. And it's cool to have somebody who understands how to draw and understands what it means, you know, to work on a show to also help navigate you know, people moving into new roles and making sure Barry Barry gets whatever he wants. And then obviously like, it's not all directors. There's also these background designers and these character designers and these color teams. It's all these different artists. You know, Nolan Obena is the, is our, our, um, um, is our, our art director. And he's kind of like the one that makes sure that the show is, is being designed and, and, and is being drawn and, and, and everything in a way that's going to work harmoniously with the board teams. So the short answer is, you find these leads that you trust that you can that that when you're when you have a vision for something they have their own vision and it meets it meets somewhere in between in a way that's better than you even imagined and then when they want to when they want to promote people you know that they're speaking that visual language and that they're doing that too you know yeah hey mike i wanted to um, ask you because it's very clear that you or somebody on the team loves the episode star trek next generation episode lower decks <laughs> 
Uh, mm. That was always one of my favorite episodes. I always thought it was underrated, one of the best episodes, in my opinion, because it, it really just gave us a completely different tone and view of Star Trek. And the prequel to that kind of was the first duty, yeah. I think, in the fifth season with the Culvert Starburst that yeah. I'm seeing right here maneuver yeah. with Cito Jaxa with uh, Nicholas Locarno and all that. Can you tell us who is that big giant Lower Decks fan? Is it you? Yeah, I mean, it's me. You know, I <laughs> Lower Decks has always been my favorite. It's so funny. First Duty, not my favorite. But you get Lower Decks from it. First Duty, when I first watched it, it bummed me out because, like, I didn't want Wes to fail Picard. Like, that 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 hurt, you know? And, like, I didn't think a Starfleet Academy member could behave like Nick Locarno did. And and seeing that episode, like, as an adult seeing that episode, it's it's, you know, it's a good episode. Like, I get it. But, like... As a kid, you feel let down by your heroes in it. You're you you're feeling like you're on board with Picard, and then Lower Decks, the episode, uh, really has always spoken to me because, again, and I just said it five minutes ago, I just want to spend time in Star Trek. You know what I mean? And like the more Star Trek I get, the better. And Lower Decks has always been a backdoor pilot to me. Like it's like saying, here's a new crew. Oh, you like Star Trek? Oh, you like Deep Space Nine? You like you know you like you're gonna like Voyager and Enterprise? Guess what? We're going to give you one episode with a new crew, you know, and you, and the crew you're used to are there. Like, I I didn't formulate Lower Decks to be an extension of the original Lower Decks. Lower Decks, the animated show, the original pitch was, I want to do a Star Trek where I just invert the A stories and the B stories, where the little funny downbeat comedic B stories are going to be the new focus and then the A stories, the dramatic plot, are going to be in the background, you know? And I think you could say that, like, the original Lower Decks inspired me because I just wanted to tell more stories in Star Trek that didn't need that big story, you know? Like, that's a comfort episode for me. That's an episode that, mm -hmm. like, it shows what Star Trek is capable of, that you can shift the focus of the episode. And it just proved to me that, like how you could do a series that takes place on a Cardassian station or in another quadrant or back in time, you could also do an episode, you could do a whole series focusing on crew and a ship that isn't the coolest or isn't the most in charge, you know? And so, so yeah, like Lower Decks is always really, the episode is always really, really spoken to me as a fan and as a, as a, as a show creator and as a show writer. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Lower Decks, the, sh the animated show is so like you take that one little inspiration and then you grow it and you grow it into something that's like, if you didn't make the direct connection, somebody might not put that together. You know what I mean? Like Lower Decks, the show is inspired by all of Star Trek and the let's invert, let's invert the focus was inspired by Lower Decks, the episode. Mike, did your formula change in this fourth season? Because um, we did get this overarching storyline in every episode for the most part where you had this mysterious ship that kept being referred to and we love by the way the the way the different crews talk to each other i, I think that was <laughs> one of the highlights of this season too just watching the ferengi ships talk to each other yeah. romulan crew binars we loved all of that so the, binars. <laughs> the binars are all piping in yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes uh um so was was that something new that you thought you were going to do for this season? Like, oh, we're going to do a, like an overarching storyline, yeah. um, something to take a different approach uh, for this season? Yeah, you know, I'm always learning while we're making stuff. Like in the last in the last five years, you know, I've either written or done passes on or produced, I guess you could say, over 100 episodes of television because of doing Lower Decks and Solar Opposites simultaneously right off of Rick and Morty. And you know, my, I always have plans for character arcs, how things I want, you know, how I want them to go. But then sometimes I find in writing the characters and working with actors and seeing designs, things that are better than I thought of sitting in a room, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. as long as it works, as long as it's in the spirit of the show, as long as it doesn't contradict kind of what we've done before, I like to try to keep things open enough for those things to to be doable, you know, and especially seasonally, you can change it up a little bit. And so this season, there were two things that made me want to kind of change the 
the format a little bit of the show, right? I knew every episode had to have an A story, a B story with with emotionally driven comedic stories with a with a C runner that's a, a big Star Trek thing happening in the background, right? That's a, a basic Lower Decks episode. You know, if you pitch, hey, here's a thing that happened to me in my 20s and here's a sci-fi version of it, that's the A story and the B story. And then the C runner is a big, you know, a big sci-fi important Star Trek thing that is just sort of affecting our two stories. That's that's a classic Lower Decks. And this season, I learned two things. I love Wage Douge, the episode we did second season that yeah. focuses on the Lower Decks of the other three ships. And I wanted more of that because Lower Decks is about expanding the things you've seen in Star Trek in places that live action kind of couldn't do because it was too expensive in some ways, you know? Or because they were episodic and they never thought they were going to bring them back. Like, I like doing that, you know, with Exocomps or PacLeds or Nick Lacarno. Like, there's... Lots of ways to do it. Going to Orion, you know, seeing another side of that. But then, you know, doing season three, I also learned a lot about structuring. How how much appetite do I have for a big mystery? You know, we did this big AI ship and we did a Rutherford episode that tied into it. And it, it you know, there's lots of like, there were lots of opportunities across a season to tell a long form story. But I never wanted it to take over. I didn't want Lower Decks to become a long-form story season. So I wanted both. I wanted standalone episodes with these little cold opens that when you tie them all together at the end of the season, they're telling one big coherent story. And then I found little ways to tie them into the episodes. You know, like, oh, I wanted to do an Agnes and Peanut Hamper and Badgie story, which technically our characters get pulled into because they need information about the overarching story. But if you haven't seen any other episode, that episode's still standalone. You know, there's a little bit about it. but like. What Lower Decks is doing isn't about a big serialized thing, you know, I, but at the same time, we're on Paramount Plus, you get every episode. It's not like me growing up being like, oh, gosh, I got to catch this week's Star Trek. I hope I don't miss it. You've got every episode. So I knew that an audience going in and watching this show is always going to have the opportunity to have every clue leading up to the Locarno stuff. You know what I mean? And so it gave us the opportunity to like, to do these little cold opens that I got to have fun and, and, and. And get to see more of these aliens and get to build this little thing and, and have it be meaningful to characters, but also still get to do the episodic stuff. And that that was really it. It was season three's season long runner mixed with Wage Douge and wanting to kind of perfect that formula a bit. Wow. Yeah, uh, we we love it. Um, I, I just want to highlight some of that. But two Vix, uh, I have no bones yet. I must believe. <laughs> yes. In the cradle of Vexalon. Um, Something borrowed, something green, empathological fallacies. And, and by the way, um, Mike, you have been giving the most homage to, I would say, uh, past ep- Star Trek episodes, right? This show has sure. done the most of that, I, I would say, by you know, the, all of the different universes and storylines that you've touched on in this in this show. Um, it's been a treat to watch some of these things flushed out, especially in the comical way. I mean, the whole, I think he looks like Tom Paris. Uh, I mean, he's, <laughs> he's like, like, it's like the same laugh. face. He's like the same <laughs> face. That bit makes me, you know that a bit is good when it makes you laugh and you've seen it 300 times. Like just the way they perform those lines is so funny. And like you hit on it, Sirak is like the, the reason that we we go back all the time is because the comedy has to come from a shared place. Like the comedy has to come from character and from things we all know together. So like diving back, looking back is really helpful from a comedy perspective. Cause I know you guys all have that too. <laughs> we do. Um, and, and, and speaking of comedy, this is laced with uh, this, this episode, by the way, and I wanted to ask you about this too, was like budget wise, because it felt like the biggest, I don't know, Ryan, did you feel like you, were, I felt like I was watching the motion picture. It felt like a, almost like a movie. I yeah, feel like yeah. I saw the crystalline entity too in that opening theme. <laughs> <laughs> These yeah, guys spare like no expense. The finales always feel like a big movie. You know what I mean? Like yes. that's something we've done in Lower Decks. You know, we're four for four. And I'll tell you, uh, season five, you know, I just finished writing the finale of that. And that's probably our biggest movie ever. You know what I mean? Like I... My biggest fear is that we're so busy telling a big movie that you lose some of the comedy and the characters. So it's like, I'm just constantly like, it's got to be big, but it's got to, it's got to feel like Lower Decks the whole time. And that's, you know, 
this this episode you guys just watched definitely feels great to me. Like Mariner talking, calling a Genesis device GD, getting a seatbelt on the bridge of a Starfleet ship. When like, she said, you're my first on. officer, okay? I was like, that's the cutest thing I think I've ever heard so her cute. say. For this. She's like, you're my first officer, yay. <laughs> Picking that ship, just like making it, making it our little Wrath of Khan, you know, but like a Wrath of Khan with a Trinar shield, like it's, yes, it's <laughs> funny, really but it's also a, a movie. Is that, trinar, is that three she, binars? That was the, the that's three binars. That's a trinar. That's a trinar sitch. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, hey, I mean, they're I'm, trying to shoot through it. Well, you should be yeah. trying our shield then. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be able to. Yeah, oh god. <laughs> the, the Mark Twain stuff has me rolling all the time. Don't have Ryan uh, write any of your jokes. Don't worry, we'll. He's not uh, available for obviously. <laughs> Mark Twain pulling the Mark, Mark Twain, stuff Twain. Back in again. Yes. In the Again. finale made me laugh. I was like, I don't know. That's another one of those. I don't know if anybody else can like this, but it makes me laugh out loud. For that to be Talin being like, this works. We gotta use it. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole fluff, you're down. I mean, th there were just too many, too many moments in this episode where I found, found myself really laughing. And, I, and, and Captain mm -hmm. Freeman's court martial speech, you know, to kind of like rally the crew. Another classic you know, Star Trek type moment, right? In yeah. this animated show, which is like a serious moment, but yeah, but classic, you know. But in that moment, moment, you see Goodgy like paying attention. You're yeah, like, yeah. Yes. Court Marshall. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you can't sneak that bias. We caught. Him. We're like, wait a second. So funny. And we also yes. saw Boothby in the corner too. That was amazing to see that cameo at uh, Starfleet uh, Academy. Uh, yep. But Mike, yes. we only have you for about thirty more seconds here. So before you go, can we just say? Thank you for making Lower Decks. Thank you for always being so gracious with your time and your thoughts and making us laugh on this show. Uh, we really appreciate you. And we are really looking forward to season five coming out in like two months, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> season five coming out sometime next year. We're still, if it came out in two months, it would be black and white or not even drawn yet. But uh, yeah, no, guys, book. I really, listen, All this is my dream show to make. I love talking about it. I love hearing you guys laugh with me and, and liking it. Like you guys know better than anybody. Like you guys are true fans. And I think, I think there's always a temptation to be like, to not give things a chance. Cause you already have the things you like. Why would you take a chance on something new? And just the way you guys have embraced the show and the way you go into it being like, Oh, this is, this is probably going to be good. Like I know that some people go and they sit down and they watch our show and they're like, what am I going to hate this week? And they just come up with a lot. Like, that's not why you make TV. You make TV to like make people laugh, make them feel like make them have a good time, get to spend another half an hour in Star Trek. And like, I think you only get that if people sit down and they go, oh, I really want to like this. I hope it's going to be good. And then they can. My job is to surprise you guys and, and give you something you didn't know you wanted every single time, whether it's a new season runner or surprises with characters. I will say just because you're my first, you're the first folks, you're the first civilians I've talked to outside of the show. <laughs> What do you think of that uh, that little that little turn with uh, Tendi at the end, where she's like, "I've got this," and that cool music hits? How'd that and her eyes out? darken? I loved yeah, it. Yeah, it, it felt I love great because it though. actually I was sad that she was leaving, and it gave me mm -hmm. something to look forward to, uh, which I I'm guessing is coming up in season five, totally. which is an adventure line for her in which she'll become relevant again and get rejoined. So I did feel Rutherford's like pain. Also felt weird because it was just right after Talin says, I'm going to be your science bestie. Yeah, I know. And then, yeah. and then, and then, like, <laughs> and then you get it pulled away yeah. for a minute well, and a half. Andy will return. But <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted it to feel like, oh, no, we're losing somebody. But then have this moment of power for Tendi where you're like, oh, I can't wait to see what she gets up to. You know, yes. like yes. I just that the music and Noelle's acting and the way they they directed that moment. I'm like. One of my favorite yes. ending to a season. So I'm just really excited because we're recording this. You guys have seen it, but everybody else is about to see it. And that one moment, I'm I'm really proud of that whole episode. And like, I don't know. I'm just geeking out with you guys. I just want to know what you I, thought. I have to add one other <laughs> thing too, Mike, while you're here. Uh, the yeah. Attacking and addressing my mental health with Mariner's character, having her kind of yeah. deal with that. It's something very real that a lot of people on a serious note can can learn some things from and and also identify with so i just wanted to also thank you for throwing yeah. those little bit tidbits in because they matter as far as just 
It's like, you, yeah. I don't feel like I'm watching an animated show anymore. When I tune in and watch Lower Decks, I feel like I'm watching oh. the, the crew of one of my favorite starships go through an adventure and I'm, and I'm signing up for laughter. So I suspend some of the seriousness of what I have in the Star Trek world. Yeah. So I, I, I love the adventure you take us well, on. Mike. I appreciate Thank you so that. Much. And with Mariner's mm-hmm. mental health, I'll say like, look, Mariner is always learning. We're always all learning. Mental health is something that we all, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, mental health is health, you know, and it's, yeah. it's even the coolest, best of us have, have things that they might've, you know, not processed and, and, if there's people out there who are hurting or anything, like just know that like there's always paths forward. There's always new ways to look at stuff. There's always help out there, like you know, mm-hmm. and that it doesn't make you any better or worse than anybody else. Like Mariner, Mariner is gonna move forward and still be Mariner. Like like addressing some stuff about yourself or some stuff that you might be holding on to doesn't make you not you. You know, and I love that like there's that Mariner moment where she's like Starfleet still isn't always right, but like. She's in talk. If we only all had a Klingon, maybe a therapist instead of Klingon would be helpful. Like getting to move forward and be like, you know, wow, I didn't think about it like that. I can still be mad, but I don't have to, I don't have to let this, I don't have to, I don't have to carry this weight. Like I did. I can actually embrace it and move forward. Like, you know, I think stories like that are really, I try to be respectful about mental health because I think like we all have stuff going on like that. And Mariner's the fucking coolest, you know, and if she can deal with it and she can, she can look at it like, and, 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 and move forward and still be funny and still be fun and still be a good Starfleet officer. Like Mariner doesn't change after this. She just gets even funnier and better. Like you'll like Mariner even more moving forward. I do. I do. Mm -hmm. I love that Boimler Dan said, Oh, she's back when she's, you know, like, let's go hit the bar and get drunk. Oh, yeah. She's back. (laughs) Yeah. And we want to so, say the uh, voice the voice acting's amazing. You mentioned Noel, but all of them are just Noel's oh, killing yes. it. Tawny's killing it. They're all just week oh, after great. week, Eugene. we're shocked by how great they are. And you know, it's not an easy gig. A lot of people think it is. Just go there and say lines. It is very difficult. And these well, how about Robbie bringing it back as as Lacarna? Absolutely. Yeah. Fun, right? Really he killed yes. it. Really no, killed man. it. We had a Will Wheaton sighting in this. Uh-huh. I mean, just oh yeah, Shannon Phil, Shannon as Phil, Cito Jackson. We had to track down. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. Nicest person I've ever met. Wow. Like my line producer Brad still texts with her. We love her. We oh. got to get her to a convention. I don't think wow. she had performed for like thirty something years. And we we were like, come back. We'll pay your SAG dues. Come on to Lower Decks. <laughs> yes. And she brought her daughter to Lower Decks. Like, she brought her to the record. Oh. Like, we had a blast. Oh, and, like, sweet. you know, getting to be a part of this Star Trek family and, like, getting to do this show is just such a treat. And you guys are part of that. And I do really appreciate Thank you. you being fast the show. It's awesome. And you're right. We, she we will be love. all the rage at a convention. She would be all the rage. And I, oh. I do want to say one thing to you, Mike, on our way out. You gave us a lot of credit. We really appreciate you saying that we came in with eyes wide open. I want to say I'm a little bit of a snooty Star Trek fan. When <laughs> I, I kind of did come in like, all right, well, let's little see bit. what this is. I know. <laughs> let's see what this is. But I want to give you the credit, Mike. You convinced me. I didn't watch the first episode already convinced it was going to be great. You and your team, the actors and the creators and everybody, you guys convinced me that this is great Star Trek. Well, and great we only convinced you because you you enjoyed it. And there's a lot of people that couldn't make that leap like you do, you know, and it's they like will. letting yourself be happy and, and loving Star they Trek. Will. It's good for you. It's good for you. Mm-hmm. You know, it become, it, it's based in love and the love that you have is it, it, it seeps through the episode. So clearly everybody working on this show uh, has a love for their job, love for the work that they do, and also a love for kind of carrying that star trek legacy forward and making making light of stuff you guys are doing the, a fantastic totally. job this season four was phenomenal um thank you and we just and i just i just can't wait to see more so mike thank you so much for joining well, we're working really. hard on season five i will be back with the seventh rule in season five for you guys to tell me if i if i let you down <laughs> or if i held it up hold me yeah, you know right. hold me to it and then uh and yeah if you guys you know if you ever want to chat just give me a heads up Looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Mike McMahon. We really appreciate you and everybody at Paramount and Titmouse for making this happen. Everybody at home, stick around. We've got much more coverage of this final episode. 
of the fourth season on The Seventh Rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. Hello, hello. We've got an amazing guest right now. He is a prop designer for Star Trek Lower Decks and a Star Trek consultant for CBS. That's a pretty cool gig. It is Phil Murphy. Hello, Phil. How are you today? Hey, great to meet you. Great to meet everyone. Absolutely. Calling in all the way from Ireland, in fact. <laughs> yep. So first things first, let's just get into this. Can you tell everybody when you are designing props? How does that come about? Did you design the props way ahead of time? Are the animators creating the characters and then they say, put something in this hand? Or what, what's being a prop designer all about? Um, it usually goes uh, hand in hand. Um, you have the um, handouts from the script. The scripts are come first and uh, we, then the boards are um, drawn and we pick and choose who gets which prop. And then um, the characters, if they link up, we usually work with the character designers to see which turns might need a prop turn and uh, which um, characters just might have just a one-off prop day to just use at that seat. Cool. Uh, so I, I want to say first that i um, big fan of your show. We really enjoy Lower Decks. I think it's a, it's a hit show. Oh, yeah. It's extremely funny, very entertaining. And there's so many elements at play that I've, I've really come to learn about the process of animation and how, what it takes to put these things together. And, um, you know, the first big question really I have for you, just about being an artist. I see you have a lot of uh, toys around you and props around you actually <laughs> in real life. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems like you have a lot of fun. And that's one thing that, you know, we talk with Mike McMahon about, about the level of fun everybody's having putting this show together. Uh, were you a Star Trek fan beforehand um, coming into this project? And what about being uh, knowledgeable about Star Trek gives you the edge or advantage when you're um, doing your, your work for the show? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was definitely a Star Trek fan um, before I joined up. I was really brought up on Star Trek. TNG was my first Star Trek. So I was born when... TNG was in its middle of its run, so I grew up from there with TNG. Um, it's definitely has it, it, its eggs come in, you know, like you can recall back to like, there's this prop needed here, and I, so you might be able to say, oh, I could probably reuse a prop from this episode and kind of sneak it in for the fans to spot, and uh, maybe even adjust it a little. So they might be hard to spot or they may put this and this together to make this problem. So that's always a fun thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Since you brought up TNG, <laughs> I would love to get into that as well, because uh, you, you're a Star Trek consultant. First of all, that's got to be the coolest gig ever. And I feel like every Star Trek fan in the world thinks they are a Star Trek consultant, but you're actually doing it. They're like, <laughs> Let me tell you something about Star Trek, even to the people that don't want to hear it. But this has got to be the coolest gig. First of all, before we get too deep into that, can you tell us, is The Next Generation your favorite series and why? Uh, yeah, um, it kind of fluctuates. I, I have a lot of favorite series of Star Trek, so I have to, I have to say... Um, <laughs> TNG is up there. I have to say DS9 is my favorite series of Star Trek, though. So. Yes. <laughs> All right. Good answer. Um, Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's definitely um, one of the the most loved, I, I think, of my... Uh, I think Voyager is also uh, great because um, it's kind of like that a whole family unit on the ship that travels through space just sticking together. And DS9 is like a western on the outskirts trying to just survive on what what happened to them. and then tng is like the explorers out into space and the tos then was like the original guys setting the mission out yeah and then tell us about this consulting um like what what does that kind of uh you know comprise of for you 
Oh, um, um, well, see, an art consultant on some projects that they uh, recently, um, I was doing designs for the Star Trek crews, so they, they uh, asked me to like consult and design um, the um, lower decks um, designs for that, and uh, uh, sometimes secret projects that I, I I really shouldn't talk about. I can't go into. Okay, them, so. all right. Tell us. Right. Tell, tell us. <laughs> yeah, 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 no. <laughs> Can you tell us what you uh, helped with the cruise with? Because Sorok and I are both uh, I, I, cruise yeah, goers. I, I was on the last cruise in which I did see a lot of original artwork um, on board the cruise, some original designs, kind of lower deck theme because the, the ship, I, I believe, is the Mariner. Um, so there was yeah. a lot of, you know, yeah. links in there. So I'm sure that. I might have seen some of the work that you created, uh, Phil, on on that journey. Yeah, yeah, it was the um, lower deck crew. Um, they had some um, art segment. Um, uh, the lower deck crew was all in their naval, old school naval gear. So that was a lot of fun to draw. You know, uh, because. Can I a couple of years ago, they had that bag, that like blue bag that I've got over here. And it looks just yeah. like the old TNG bag that they <laughs> would carry off to the holodeck when they're going to go do their karate practice or something like that. I don't know if you had any part of that, but sometimes it seems like the people at the Star Trek crews really do these deep cuts that we don't necessarily notice right yeah, at first. Yeah. But then for me, it, was, it wasn't until I got home and we start reviewing the next generation. And we see the bag. I'm like, wait a minute, that's the bag that the crews, boy, these guys are way ahead of it. Were they giving you like these deep cut kind of things or was it more broad strokes, uh, general themes? They, um, they give me, um, they're like, we want to see this. So then they let me free reign as um, they might have some input. Oh, can we see this? Or can we see this? And then I just kind of do up some sketches and say, oh, would you like to see this? And then just go from there and see what happens. Hmm. Uh, so what makes you specialize in um, props and backgrounds and all of those kinds of like how do you as an artist determine that this is the the thing that best suits my skill set like how is it that it's not something hmm. else like like what is it about being an artist that makes you specialize in a particular uh, field of it um, it's mostly what, what you really like to do, I suppose. Um, I I mostly do characters, props, and uh, uh, those. Uh, it, it, I I really like the technical aspect of props, where you can take apart something and like think about how it works, how you can put it together, and how it would affect everything around it. Like if you have a um, like, uh, a tricorder and how that opens up, how it closes, how it might break apart, or if it's uh, explodes, how it shatters into pieces. That's always fun to think about when you're designing a prop. Mm -hmm. Now, can we just show off your website for a second here, Phil? Because you've done so much cool stuff. I was tinkering around yeah. on this a while back, and I just want to show everybody this stuff here. So we've got some Spider-Man uh, <laughs> stuff, yep. right? Mysterio, cool. Uh, Dr. Octopus looking stout. And Batman, uh, that looks like... <laughs> that looks... Oh, okay, that's Powerpuff Girls. Sorok's a big Powerpuff Girls fan. <laughs> um, but there was they something the daughter, nice. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one, look yeah, at this. Yeah, that, that, that jumped out at me as well. It's a it's yeah. a Star Trek Enterprise uh, Transformer that you've called Fortress Tiberius. The face looks extremely Transformers from and you know I'm a big Star uh, Transformers fan from back in the day. This folding forward, uh, kind of yeah. like the nose of the saucer section, is also very typical to Transformers. Like when they would have a car that would fold forward and the head would come out. This yeah, clearly cool. shows that you've got a very good understanding of the mechanics of the original Transformers from the 80s, the way they transform. Could you tell us about that a bit? Yeah, uh, this was done for the um, 2018 um, comic series, uh, Star Trek vs. Transformers. Um, 
uh, in if the um, TOS crew comes across the um, the um, original G1 Transformers where they had to leave Earth during World War Three, and um, they crash land on the planet, and then the TOS crew come along and they wake up and they have a big fight with the Decepticons and the Klingons and everything just meshes together. Um, we definitely wanted to um, get the feel of the G1 uh, cartoon and the TO and the TAS animated series, uh, um, the Star Trek TAS series, uh, which means that you had to, you couldn't have too detailed or too uh, everything just moving around. So we had to make it all kind of bendy and kind of like it would easily break apart when um, you um, transform. So if you go back and look at the original toys, it was all just bend here and then this little piece pops out. So we want to get that in the in the original enterprise. Look. Yeah, that's amazing. You did, you did do that. I I saw that same uh, image and it popped out to me as well. Um, but the other thing that popped out to me, Phil, was the variety of styles that you have to your art. Like I, I saw, like this Transformers. This is a particular look. This but is then Eric's. You can do, how yeah. cool is that? Eric's and Emress. Yeah. 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 Uh, later yeah. on the book, yeah. the um, the uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, yeah, no, later no. on the book, the um, the yeah, <laughs> later on the book, cool. the uh, the uh, crew get uh, their own mech suit. So we had to um, think about how how they they could break break the power shuttles and make them into a robot to fight the transformers. So yeah, that is amazing. No, I was going to ask you really um, um, stylistically going from one project to another, like like something that we see here with this hybrid Transformers Star Trek, but then going to Lower Decks and then going to Powerpuff Girls and all of these different styles, I would say, when I visually, as the consumer, the audience, I see something totally different. Um, what is the... What is the biggest thing that goes into changing your style? Because I would think that as an artist, you would only have like a look to your stuff and it, it kind of looks one way. How do you make it look so many different ways? Yeah, um, uh, some artists do. They make um, they're like a lot of comic artists stick to their one style for their whole career. Uh, but um, um, I think in uh, when you're designing, uh, uh, working on anime series and designing props and characters, it's really helpful when you can meld into the show that you're doing. Like if you can, I, I'm lucky. I can usually just take a few pictures um, from reference and say, okay, yeah, I can get that style. Uh, um, I always give that advice to if I'm a young artist. Like if you can fill your portfolios with um, different styles, if you can train yourself in different styles, it, you're you're a lot easier to get into uh, any position that might be opening. You know, I'm seeing so, a lot uh, of really it, cool. It's, um, Sorry, go ahead, Phil. Uh, no, I was just saying it's a, it's easier for me. I I I I really put it that sort of thing. But, um, but I I I think um, when you if you train yourself to do that, it, it will be um, it come positions will come easier to you. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to say that we're seeing a lot of really cool stuff in your background. I know we see a the. One part of a blade of a batleth, obviously, uh, up on your wall, and there's a mechleth up there even higher. Looks like there's definitely some stepping stools needed to put those way up there. You've got swords. You got a giant shax looking over you and protecting you every day. Right. You've got a a kashan <laughs> over there as well, and a lower decks thing. Clearly, uh, I see a gremlin. I mean, it feels like it's a party at your place. And basically, I'm inviting myself to your place out in Ireland. But uh, until then, <laughs> can you just tell us a little bit more about season four of Lower Decks? Did you have some some favorite moments upon viewing it or ahead of time where that you were really looking forward to? Are there any things that really stick out to you for this season? Uh, this, well, this is my first season, so it's obviously my favorite season. <laughs> uh, so um, I think my favorite episode was the um, Agamus and Peanut Hamper. <laughs> I got to um, draw Agamus, which was definitely a highlight um, for me. Uh, Jeffrey Combs is uh, one of my favorite Star Trek actors, so drawing a character he voiced was amazing. So um, 
definitely seeing Mariners kind of dealing with her past and uh, the return of Nick and it's just um, seeing these characters just uh, come back and finish out their story has just been amazing to just be part of that. You know, uh, Jeffrey yeah, Combs is, is actually playing me right now. Uh, he's an impressive <laughs> actor. He can play anybody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> please continue, Sir Ock. Sorry. Jeffrey Combs, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> No, I wanted to say, uh, Phil, this this season has been very entertaining for us. We really have enjoyed this fourth season. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, are there any things that you hid in the background that maybe we didn't catch um, that's just waiting to be discovered um, it, it, that, that you're willing to reveal? <laughs> oh, you know, that's that's the first question. Uh, and, I think, uh, think about it. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I think they've all been spotted by now. The fans are great at spotting the Easter eggs at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, we've been looking. We we paused the screen and we're looking for everything mm -hmm. that we can see. So um, <laughs> that's one of the fun games of watching the show. The other thing is, Phil, you know, um, your screensaver is a animated version of yourself. And for the audience out there that can't see that, when when you do log out and click out, uh, the screen saving home screen is a picture that I'm pretty sure you drew of yourself uh, in Starfleet Lower Decks uniform. And I think that's really cool because I've always said if I could draw, I would, you know, obviously draw myself into as much as I could. And if I could sing, I'd be singing all the time. So since I can't do either and I can only admire other people, um, do you do you ever get tempted to draw yourself? There it is, right there. Gorgeous. Do you ever Amazing. get do you ever get tempted to draw yourself into uh, projects that you work on? Um, I, I do sometimes. Um, <laughs> we uh, we tend to go through uh, uh, we tend to go through uh, approval processes. So uh, I, I usually sparingly, whenever I, I I get the chance, I, I might slip myself in. So we uh, we have to see. <laughs> And another question for you, Phil. Have you ever been to a Star Trek convention, if not a science fiction convention? Because I know you're out in Ireland and it's kind of a ways to make it out to one, but uh, have you ever been to one? I have been to science fiction conventions um, here in Ireland. Uh, I have not been to a big Star Trek convention yet. That's on my book list. I really want to get to nice. one. Nice. So, <laughs> <laughs> if you do ever make it out to one, obviously there's a big one in London. Uh, there's one in Germany as well called uh, FedCon, or the the London one used to be in Birmingham, if I remember correctly. Or the biggest, dare I say, the biggest in the world in uh, in Las Vegas. Either way, uh, the closer to Las Vegas you get, the higher the chance that we can buy you a beer when we see you there. Uh, the, one, the ones in <laughs> Ireland are going to be a little tougher. But uh, if we're ever out that way, we'll definitely let you know. Phil, we only have about another minute with you here. Boy, I keep looking at your background. You're clearly legit. You're a hardcore fan, and we do hope to see you at a convention sometime. But yeah. honestly, congratulations on this gig. This is your first season. We hope Lower Decks continues on for many more seasons, and I hope, we hope that you will be with the show for many more seasons. Very big congratulations to you, to Titmouse, uh, which has been doing amazing work, and of course to Paramount for providing yep. us with memories of a lifetime. Uh, but really, we just appreciate you, Phil, and we we hope to see you again a lot more times, honestly. Thanks very much for having me. And uh, again, yeah, um, Titmouse is amazing. The team there are, are just knocking out of the park with everything they've been doing, the, the, all the characters, the props, my my prop is, uh, friend Eddie, who, who's just a machine knocking props out every twist and turn. It's just amazing <laughs> seeing his work. Uh, it's just uh, it's just uh, amazing getting to work on Lower Decks. It's uh, just a dream come true for me. Mm -hmm. Seems it. Well, keep up the good work, man. We, we, yeah. we love the show. We're big fans. We were already sold, and we're looking forward to season five, which we hear is also going to be great. And you haven't let us down so far. A really entertaining show, and I, I just see nothing but success in the horizons. 
especially if they have, you know, the team that we've met so far, that the, the people that are working on this project seem to have a true passion for their work. They have a love for Star Trek and a respect for the kind of, you know, integrity and the thought that goes into making all of this stuff. So uh, we really appreciate Phil having you on and definitely look forward to this upcoming season as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This was amazing. We we didn't catch that last thing. Would you say, Phil? Sorry. Well, uh, thanks for having me. It's been amazing. Awesome. See you again soon, hopefully. And everybody at home, stick around. We've got much more uh, coverage, and by much more, I mean some more. We'll be right back on <laughs> the Seventh Rule. Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to the Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. That was hey, hey. Phil Murphy, also Mike McMahon. Before that. Still a lot to talk about, though. This is the end of a season. Yeah. This is the end of any new Star Trek we're going to be seeing for the rest of the year, certainly. So um, really happy that this ended with such a big bang. Let's get those trivioids of the week real quick before we get into this. Um, Beckett Mariner is Cito Jax's fan club. Nicholas Locarno's ship is very white. Nick Lacarno looks confident, but you know, like in a creepy kind of way. Mariner's first officer is a Genesis device. Can you have three binars anyway? But Eth has really bad allergies. Boimler has never seen anyone actually use the captain's yacht. That was cool. The Ferengi put a paywall on a bomb. Livick and Rutherford only like each other when they're twaining. Boy. <laughs> There was a lot of stuff there. I do say I love that idea. Hey, that's what a wonderful idea. <laughs> I'm glad they brought that back, honestly. The I love that, too. The twaining is hilarious. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there. Was, this episode was, was kind of laced up with a lot of stuff. Um, I like the whole scene. It's funny how they take scenes from the you know next generation so when wesley was in that scene it really felt like you know you're getting a, a flashback scene with wesley <laughs> yeah it was nuts and you know what i like when i'm seeing <laughs> when i'm seeing actors that i know we know will wheaton we know how he acts we know yeah. how wesley crusher acts uh cedo jaxa she was in a couple episodes of the next generation we know how she delivers lines um and same thing with Robert Duncan McNeil. But here's what I found to be really interesting with that. They don't 100% deliver their lines like they did on The Next Generation or on Voyager or whatever. They deliver them in the lower decks fashion. So somebody is in that director's chair or you know, on the director's mic saying, can you, can you spaz it up a little? Can you zip it up a bit or whatever it is that they say? Because it is definitely Will Wheaton talking, yeah. but they're making sure that his tone is matching the tone of the show, which is yes. kind of a subtle thing, but it's a very cool thing. And yeah, I, I was very happy to see Will Wheaton back. Yes. And, you know... In alignment with things with tone, another thing that kind of stood out to me was the pronunciation of the Ferengi when they were talking. There were moments when I heard the Ferengi talking where I thought to myself, Armin has coined that way of speech, that exact way. There yep. were certain ways that the Ferengi in this episode would talk. And it just reminded me of uh, somebody, he must have been watching Armin's delivery or studying some kind of tapes to, just to get some background information on how to voice the Ferengi because I felt like the accent, uh, the the enunciation, the, the certain parts were exactly delivered with the accent that uh, Armin invented for the Ferengi. Yeah, and you know, I, I found myself um, liking Mariner more today 
And, uh, you know, we already like her. She's the main character. But they added another little layer. And I felt something for her that I didn't expect, which was it was it was like watching somebody grow up, you know, and when she's had that moment, you know, when she gets into the shuttlecraft or whatever it was and says, you know, you're going to be my first officer. Yay. You know, kind of like that. It was really cute. It was a nice moment. And when bef right before that, when she turns on Nick Locarno, uh, when he expects her to speak on his behalf and she's like, these guys suck, you know, and she does that. <laughs> I actually found yeah. myself being excited because I didn't expect it. Whereas normally you can usually expect what you know what to get, what you're going to get out of Mariner. You know, she's going to be fun. She's going to be say all these funny quips. She's going to, you know, kick some ass. But I was really I, I I felt something there, you know, and that's hard to do. It's it's hard to do with animated shows. And obviously that's from the genius of Mike McMahon and from Tawny as well. But I don't know. I wanted to ask you like what you what you felt about the closure of this episode or just throughout the episode or any particular moment. Did you get that feeling that I did? Yeah, I did get that feeling. And, and, and one of the things that I liked about this episode was it was a good use of Mariner. Um, she, in a few episodes leading up to this, has had a, a smaller role, I felt. Like, not as much presence in certain episodes. There were mm -hmm. other characters getting highlighted, and and not she wasn't the focal point that much. And this, to me, shows her ability when she is the focal point, how talented Tawny is as a voice actor to make me feel this really human connection with this animated character. And the moment that happened for me in this episode was when uh, Mariner was trying to talk um, Locarno out of his own depression right his own like she was like you can you know you can let it go it's okay and like she was trying to that was that that showed a level of maturity for me too as well it was like not only is she dealing with her own issue and trying to resolve it which he's connected to because they have that you know tied in history together by the backstory but it was like it's like somebody is already trying to heal themselves but has the maturity also to reach out to someone else who they feel needs that same kind of advice. Mm -hmm. So that was the level, that was the moment for me that I was like, oh, that's very mature of her. And the other moment I thought I felt growth was when Mariner got saved and beamed out of the ship, right? When she was really willing to risk her life and get shot, right? She's like, I'm not going to move and be shot anyways, but she was being beamed out. Um, in that moment, uh, after, just after that, she, she, they're like, let's get out of here. She's like, no, let's go get Locarno. So another moment that showed maturity for me and growth as a character was that she didn't just say, screw that guy. You know, it's because of him. My friend died. It's because of him. He just tried to kill me. Um, all of this stuff, you know, he just risked all of our lives. He put us all in danger. Da, 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 da. And even in, all, even in that moment, she still said, Hey, let's help that guy. You know, let's save him. Another kind of growth for me. Yeah, we also got a couple uh, rules of acquisition. So you know, I had to write yeah. them down. Rule of acquisition yeah. ninety-one: Your boss is only worth what he pays you. Uh, rule of acquisition two: I wonder if the uh, I wonder who added that line. I wonder if it was like. When you know somebody else just kind of like snuck that in a little later, and then the higher ups are like, "Hey, no, I'm sure it was there since the beginning." Uh, then there's rule of acquisition number two eighty nine: shoot first, count profits later. That's a nice twist off shoot first, ask questions later. So yeah. that was fun. Uh, we also had a, a good G uh, cameo, and we yeah. had a Booth B cameo. So Booth B, for anybody that doesn't know, he's an old groundskeeper at Starfleet Academy. Uh, I can't remember the actor, but he's been in a million things. And, uh, you know, he befriended Picard when Picard was growing up or when Picard was in Starfleet Academy. Uh, he's always around. He talked to Picard, I believe, again, when during uh, the first duty in season five. So it's really nice to see him in the bottom right corner of the screen, just 
you know, pulling weeds or doing whatever he does. That was cool. And it was cool to see the whole Nova Squadron, except for, I believe the character's name is Josh. And I don't remember if we ever saw Josh <laughs> because we didn't in this thing. But it's like we know what, you know, what happens to him. I don't know. Um, we don't have a yeah. ton of time on this, but I still want to make sure we hit all the major points. What were you going to say, Srock? I thought it was cool with um, Boimler, acting Captain Bernard Boimler, when he had that moment in the captain's chair. I thought, I don't know what why it felt so, you know, you always notice, like, who sits in the captain's chair. You know, it's like, uh, actually, you have made me notice that because <laughs> every time somebody gets made acting captain, you've pointed that out in the past. And I never, you know, I wasn't going to normally think about that. But yeah, in this instance, it was Boimler. And I thought, I thought of you and I said, oh, okay. Um, just like when I see away teams, I now think of, you know, you're highlighting away teams all the time. So, yes, um, acting Captain Boimler was cool for me. I, I enjoyed that as well. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, I actually went back and paused it because I wanted to see the full crew. It's really fun to see. That was the lower decks crew taken over. So you had Boimler as captain. You had Talyn as the first officer. So that's very Kirk and Spock there with the science officer, the Vulcan science officer being the first officer. Uh, also, we had Ensign Barnes being one of the two people at the helm or comm. Uh, we had Rutherford and Tendi in the back. And then we also had a security officer. But it was just nice to see who's positioned where, you know, because who knows if we'll ever get to see that again. Uh, but it was nice to see when they say, all right, time for the lower deckers to handle business. Who goes where? You know, and that's and that's yeah. what it was. A uh, couple of other fu funny moments for me was when when the ship, Orion ship first appeared and Freeman says, look at the size of that thing. It, it, it just it just <laughs> it triggered something that made me laugh. OK, what did it trigger? I, just, I don't know. I'll just put it that way. But. Like when we go fishing that, and there's like a <laughs> big bass. Well, the way it was shaped, the way it just it just looked, oh. it was funny. Uh, the fish. other thing, the other thing was uh, when Lacarno says, "I didn't graduate Starfleet just to, just so I can you know uh, take apart a bomb or something, right?" And I love the line when Mariner was like, first of all, you didn't graduate." Yep. <laughs> That was a nice little zinger. Um, and then, what is the name of that? Uh, is it in Keishon or whatever it is? I yeah. thought he had one of the funny, funniest lines in this when he says, uh, Mira with sails unfurled or something yes. like that. <laughs> and I think that means like, what, time to go fast? I don't know. We always have to guess what he's piecing together based on the context. Yeah, when Rutherford yeah, kept rolling. saying he looks like Tom Paris, that was very funny. We went over <laughs> that. Seriously, he uh, looks or, exactly like him. <laughs> when uh, when Locarno says the first totally independent, unaligned yeah. fleet in the Alpha Quadrant, and then uh, Boimler says the Maquis would like a word. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and yes, oh, it was rolling. it was cool to let us know uh, that. That first duty episode at Starfleet Academy happened 13 years ago. So now we can really piece together that timeline, right? 13 years ago. Okay. Because I think Lower Deck starts maybe something like six years after Star Trek Nemesis or four years or something like that. So we can really get a an accurate depiction. So that means these Lower Deckers are probably floating around 30 years old right now. Uh, if, you know, 30, 31, 32, if Mariner 13 years ago was a first year cadet. But it's just nice when they give us that exact year. It, it helps to kind of piece it together in my mind, at least. Another thing when Mariner says, oh, look, a, a debris of some dangerous, ambiguous space debris. Just just the whole like, you know, every time there's a ship and they need to hide. It's some ambiguous space debris that happens to be around. I love that troll. Um, and the captain's yacht. I think you brought it up earlier, but I wanted to mm -hmm. talk about it. Didn't we just see the captain's yacht and make a whole episode about that? Yeah. Like, we, 
we were next just, generation episode. Yeah, we were yeah. just talking about the captain's yacht and we looked at like the designs for it. But it was really cool that we got to see uh the captain's yacht in action, which looked freaking awesome, of course. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. some ship that comes out of the other the, the main ship and you know, it's just yeah. for the captain to do a nice little tour of duty. Uh, that was really cool. <laughs> very, very good nerdy stuff there. There are a couple other funny moments that I enjoyed when Miggly Mo was fighting Baeth. And yes. uh, Tendi says, Fluff, you're down. He does. She sneezes. Miggly Mo goes, Bless you, dear. <laughs> Which I don't know why that made me laugh. <laughs> he's in the middle of a battle to the death and he's like, Bless you, dear. <laughs> and then uh, right after that, when De Erica calls the Cerritos a support ship, that's when Billups get. He's like, oh, he's rolling up his sleeves. He's like, oh, you can't call the Cerritos. Is a that was that was beautiful, good stuff. I had a lot of laughs. Uh, the the Romulan lady that was talking about Lacarno, she says he gives us the freedom to scheme at our leisure. I don't know that they really captured some good moments right before um, Tendi picks Migley Mo. She's looking for somebody to battle on her behalf. And of course, all the bros are like huffing and puffing. And they're like, yeah, they're like <laughs> drooling. Ah, let me at them. Uh, so much good stuff in this one. Lots of funny moments. Yeah, um, definitely. And the paywall for the um, Genesis device was another hilarious thing. You know, a Ferengi bomb with a Ferengi voice. I mean... They're, they're, they're just really knocked it out the park. And I did really, I had a feeling watching this episode that I was watching a season finale of a show. Like, just the same way that, you know, all season finales kind of kick it up a notch and give you a little bit more. There was a little bit more here. There was a lot of ship fight, fighting scenes and, you know, hiding in space debris and, um, you know, the Trinar defense system or whatever it was. So there was a lot of action is what I'm saying in this episode. So it wasn't like just sitting around waiting for stuff to happen. Yeah, uh, I was hoping my Trinar joke would have gone better, but I guess it didn't. When I said, oh, they're getting through the shield. Well, you should be trying our shield to, you know, you should be trying our. Oh. So anyway, uh... <laughs> you just gotta try. <laughs> you weren't trying hard enough. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't trying hard enough. Is the problem? Um, well, look, this was. It's, it's it's amazing that this is season four finale already. I don't know how Lower Decks has managed to knock out four seasons already. I believe in four years exactly. Uh, but yeah. they're working on season five. I'm very much looking forward to it. It does feel like. They're stepping it up every season a little bit better, a little bit better. Where we've left it off is with Tendi going to, you know, to handle Orion business, family business. And yeah. uh, that's obviously going to lend itself into season five. I don't know what to expect, but I'm very excited for it. And um, I, I don't know when season five is going to come out. It's probably going to be quite a while because there were some some bumps along the road this summer uh, with strikes and all that kind of stuff. But overall, I'm very much looking forward to season five. I'm very happy with season four. What do you think? Yeah, me too. Me too. I thought this season was great. Um, it was really fun to get to know a lot of the people behind the scenes. The, you know, the Megan Lloyds, uh, Brandon Williams, you know, the, the team that's behind the scene. Uh, we got a lot of, yeah. uh, Good insight. Amanda Wong, yeah. Barry J. Amanda Kelly, Wong, Barry J. Uh, Kelly, exactly. Mike McMahon, Gene Kane, of course, Phil Murphy. Yes, what a team! Uh, a great team. It just lets me know, um, you know, just like with our show on Deep Space Nine, it takes a, a collaborative effort of very talented people. It's not just one person; it's an ensemble of talented people to make a good show. And I believe that this uh, Lower Decks group has that talent on board and seems like everybody loves what they do seems like they're having the most fun and that resonates when you watch the episode so yeah i thought this was a great season and um, i'm looking forward to season five what a perfect segue it does take 
a great team to make a show. Yeah. And our team is comprised of people with the names as follows. Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, which is near Ireland, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Missouri is less close Missouri. to Ireland, uh, Bill Victor Arukin, Arukin, Titus Moeller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Mike. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfee, yeah. Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner and Jason Oaken. Everybody, please make sure to like this video. Make sure you are subscribed to this channel and you hit the bell icon for notifications. If you're listening in to the audio podcast, please make sure you're subscribed. You give us a five-star rating and leave us a nice review. Now, everybody in the comments below, let us know what was your highlight of this episode. And what was your highlight of this season? Because there are too many to name in our review here. So please keep the conversation going so that when the people that make this Lower Decks show that is so amazing, when they watch this video, they can look in the comments below and see all the things that all of you loved as well. And they can continue to get the kudos that they deserve. Sweet. I guess that's it for us. Amazing season. Great episode. Closed beautifully, ended on a nice little semi cliffhanger just to whet our appetite for next season. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, Mike and Ben, for closing us out. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right, everybody. That's it for us. Let everybody at Lower Decks know how you feel about them. Let them uh, know how much you love them and appreciate them and love their show. That's it for us. We will see you next time. And until then, always remember. The seventh rule.